Thank you very much for joining us this evening uh, for the Mechanical and Manufacturing Engineering Division uh, presentation. Um, this evening's presenter is Dr. Michael Kenyon. Uh, Michael's work crosses numerous sectors, uh, delivering life cycle assessments as part of uh, Innoval's strategic support. He's heavily involved in Innoval's innovative R&D projects and also represents Innoval uh, within several institutes, including the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining and TFI's Future Leaders Group. He completed his PhD in the AMS CDT on the effects of increasing impurity elements on the precipitation behavior of dispersoids in aluminium, magnesium, silicon alloys, sponsored by Novellus at the University of Manchester. This evening's presentation from uh, Michael is entitled Aluminium, a Contributor to Environmental Breakdown or a Critical Material for a Greener Future. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass over to Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm hoping everybody can hear me, maybe see me online, maybe not. But as long as you can hear me and you can see the slides, then that, that's the main thing. Um, so yes, thank you to Engineers Ireland and Dermot for inviting me to give this talk. It's great to be back in, in Dublin again. Um, as Dermot mentioned, my, my talk is a very dramatic title, um, but I think it really reflects the situation in terms of many material systems, of, of the reality that we're in and the impacts that a lot of material systems have on, on the environment. So aluminium, is it a contributor to environmental breakdown or a critical material for a green future? Or is it both? So I'm gonna give a brief background to myself and Innoval Technology, the company I work for. And then we're gonna look at the aluminium sector at a high level. We're gonna look at the global production, uh, the demand and growth going forwards. And then I've highlighted a few of the major sectors where aluminium is going to be used over the coming years. And we're gonna discuss what that demand growth and the effects that will have on the sustainability of the aluminium sector, improvement or um, detriment to the environment that that will have. And then we'll look at the the pathways and the targets for greenhouse gas emission reductions that the aluminium industry needs to achieve to align itself with the 1.5 degree scenario. So that's the, the Paris Accord target of keeping global warming uh, temperature rise to a maximum 1.5 degrees versus pre-industrial levels. And then we'll finish off with a few key key points and a uh, future effect of aluminium on our climate. What, what are we looking at in the future? So my name's Dr. Michael Kenyon. I'm a senior materials engineer at Innoval Technology. So we are technical consultants to the aluminium supply chain globally. So I'll move out the way to keep on the, the slide. So I've been working at Innoval about five years. I've got, I work in, in two streams really. Uh, my background's in physical metallurgy, but I also work in sustainability analysis. So that just means I help our clients understand their environmental impact with their products and processes, potentially how they can improve that in the future. For that, I was part of the Advanced Metallic Systems CDT in Manchester. So as Dermot mentioned, I did a PhD on aluminium alloys, more focused on automotive alloys and the effect of impurity elements uh, for the precipitation of particles in, in those alloys. And again, part of a few different institutes which I contribute to, mainly the Institute of Materials and Minerals and Mining, but also the Transforming Foundation Industries as well. So in about technology, so Innoval was formed about 20 years ago. Uh, it came from a company called Alcan, uh, which um, became Novellis and a few other aluminum companies. And a few of the consultants back in 2003 decided that they didn't want to move around the world. So they came together and formed Innoval across the road from where the old Alcan R&D facilities were in Banbury in Oxfordshire. And since then, we've dealt with around 550 clients and customers over around 55 countries, right across the supply chain, looking at all different sorts of aluminium alloys. We have two teams. So we have a material development group who look at failure analysis, alloy development, uh, any microstructural characterization that might need doing or testing. And then we have a process team as well who look at 
um, improving process conditions across the army supply chain. So a relatively small team, 24 of us in the building, but we are owned by Daniele, who bought in about around 10 years ago. So Daniele are a large steel equipment manufacturer, but they also now develop aluminium equipment as well, which is the main reason why they bought in about. So let's dive into the aluminium industry. So I'm going to start at the highest level and just give an overview of the industry. So if you look at the top right hand side, you see that in 2018, there's 97 million, 97 million tons of aluminium produced. Uh, around two thirds of that was from the primary aluminium sector. So primary aluminium sector including raw extraction, um, refinement of the bauxite ore, smelting and um, casting. So around 64 million tons. The other third, 33 million tons, came from scrap, so secondary material. So whether that's post-consumer scrap, got end of life scrap, <laughs> around 20 million tons, or manufacturing scrap, which is pre-consumer scrap, which is about 13 million tons. So throughout this presentation, a lot of the facts and figures will be from 2018. There's a couple of reasons for that. A lot of the baseline, um, a lot of the baseline figures for um, as a comparison for future improvement in terms of emissions and uh, forecasts are based around 2018 as the baseline year. Also, just wanted to show what a real a real production year would look like without the effect of COVID. And you can see in the table for the 2020 output, the effects of COVID there, you can see the dip in output globally was down at around 86 million tons, about 11 million tons less. And that's not exclusive to aluminium. Most material systems saw uh, a decrease in output over the over years of COVID. And we've also split that down in terms of the major sectors that use aluminium. So from transport, electrical, through packaging, and then you can see the forecast moving forward. So over the next seven to 10 years, there's going to be a significant increase in production across all the major sectors that use aluminium. And if we have a look even further than that, so 2030 onwards, you can see the significant increase in demand that's going to come from aluminium. And you can see the uh, demand from both primary aluminium and also we have uh, both primary aluminium and secondary aluminium uh, uh, from 2030 onwards significantly increasing. But as you can see, for primary aluminium, that actually plateaus uh, a little bit. And I'll explain why over the coming slides, um, when due to mainly due to the sustainability of the industry. So what this graph doesn't show is the, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the blip from COVID. But you can see that sort of effect in the 20, 2008 financial crisis when there was a, a downturn in, in the output of aluminium. The final thing I want to say on this particular figure is historically from 2000, you can see quite a significant increase in the use of aluminium. I mean, in 2000, it was barely touching on 40 million tonnes. And it's really the dominance of China who started to produce and use extensive amounts of aluminium from 2000 onwards that caused this huge uh, increase in, in production and use. And as of today, China produces over 50% of the world primary aluminium and also produces quite a significant amount of the secondary aluminium as well. So if we have a look at that, uh, break down that 10 year forecast a little bit further, so we have 2020 on the left, 86 million tonnes, and 2030 on the right. You can see that 75% of the demand increase is coming from four sectors. We have transport, electrical, construction, and packaging. And over the next few slides, I'm going to focus on a few of these sectors, and we're going to discuss why aluminium is being used, uh, how aluminium is projected to increase in those applications, and the effect on the sustainability of the sector as well. I'm going to focus on just because we've got time constraints and the industries that I mainly work in are transport, electrical and packaging. They're the industries I'm going to focus on. But there's one aspect of construction that is, is really important that over the next decade or so, there's going to be a lot of scrap available 
from demolition waste. So end of life buildings over the next 10, 20 years. There'll be a lot of 6,000 series aluminium, 5,000 series aluminium. And as I'll say later on, it's really important that we maximize the use of any end of life scrap. Well, first I'm gonna start with transport. So when I talk about transport, aluminium is used in aerospace, rail, but mainly it's the automotive industry that is driving the growth for the use of aluminium in transportation. And even historically, uh, it's the automotive industry that has widely developed and used aluminium throughout the vehicle architecture. Um, one of the main reasons for that is for lightweighting. So even before electric cars came along, regions and governments were setting legislative targets for brands and manufacturers to achieve certain emissions. And this figure just gives an example of the uh, historical EU targets that they set for particular for all the manufacturers. So you can see for a fleet of vehicles in 2015, there was a target of 130 gram per kilometer. And over the years, those targets are coming down for the manufacturers to meet. And one of the best ways, and most effective ways to reduce those tailpipe emissions is to lightweight the vehicle by using high strength aluminum alloys, replacing heavier materials like steel or thicker gauge aluminum. Now we have a rapid transition to electric vehicles. And electric vehicles don't have any tailpipe emissions. So that's really good for the manufacturers uh, that contribute to a figure like this because they give a real positive credit to the brands uh, which do contribute to these figures. That's what, partly why we're getting this very rapid transition to electric vehicles. And aluminium will be a key solution for electric vehicles. Again, mainly for lightweighting. Battery electric vehicles are much heavier than their internal combustion engine counterpart model. And I've got an example of that in a few slides. So it will be really important for aluminium to, it's a really important role for aluminium to play in the transition to electric vehicles in order to improve the range, improve the performance, the wear and tear characteristics as well. So this, a quicker slide here, just wanted to show that, I mean, pretty much every single automotive manufacturer will have these statements on their website now. They all want to reach net zero in 10 years, or they want to reduce all the scope of one and two to zero in the next 10 years, and the supply chain has to be carbon neutral in 15 years. So everybody's trying to achieve these targets, very ambitious targets. Um, and just a select example of a few here, so Volvo, Ford, say is pretty much every automotive manufacturer will have these targets uh, within their sustainability reports or on, on their website now. I still get asked the question, are electric vehicles actually better for the environment when you consider the full life cycle of the vehicle? So that's producing all the materials, producing the batteries, the use phase, the end of life considerations. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and it's pretty clear, yes, there's been many, many studies um, done on this in terms of mainly carbon footprint, because that's what we're trying to tackle mainly is climate change. But there are obviously other environmental issues to take into account. So when I'm here, I'm talking specifically about carbon footprint. And this is a study that was published by Volvo online. A, a study that I consider a good study. And what I mean by that is they're very transparent in the way that they've conducted it. They've compared vehicles within one standalone study because it's really bad practice to, to compare different studies to each other. So what they did is they looked at the carbon footprint of their XE40. So they have an internal combustion engine, XE40, and they now have a fully electric uh, XE40 recharge. So they considered the full life cycle of these vehicles. And that's what this figure shows. If you have a look at the left-hand column, this is the environmental footprint or the carbon footprint of the XC40 petrol vehicle. And you have the contribution from the different stages of that vehicle. I have the use phase is by far the biggest contribution. So that's the tailpipe emissions of the vehicle. But then you've got some at the bottom here, which is the manufacturing of the vehicle and the materials included. And then at the top, this end of life as well. 
For a battery electric vehicle, as I've already mentioned, the heavier, there's more materials, there's a bigger contribution from the materials that are produced. And aluminium is a big chunk of that in there as well. The use phase is the, there's no tailpipe emissions, but it's the electricity produced to power the vehicle. So as you can imagine, the source of that electricity, whether it's from coal fired or it's on a mixed grid or it's 100% renewable, dictates the use phase of the electric vehicle. And what they showed in this study is that even if you charge on a global average mix, so there's quite a bit of fossil fuel in there, some renewable energy, there's still overall a better carbon footprint than the internal combustion engine. And if you can charge off 100% renewables, if you have an electric car and you've got solar panels on your roof and you charge it, you can see a significant reduction in the overall emissions for the electric vehicle. So even though the materials do have a much bigger contribution, because the use phase is so much lower, electric vehicles generally do have a, a much lower carbon footprint. There are obviously other issues with electric cars. One of the main ones being critical minerals, critical materials that um, we might run out of in the next 10 years. The, these are other issues that I'm not going to go into today because they could be lectures on their own. But in terms of carbon footprint, that's why we're, we want to transition to, to electric vehicles. Next sector, so electrical. There's two main aspects to the use and growth of aluminium in the electrical sector. One, transmission and distribution infrastructure. So overhead cables, undersea cables. Overhead cables are generally 6,000 series, quite a lean alloy um, for a number of reasons. Number one, very good conductivity, electricity. So obviously a key, key property. Combine that with high strengths and good corrosion resistance, they can last a, a long time as well. So typically overhead cables could have lifetimes of 30, 40, maybe even 50 years. Um, second um, aspect to electrical, renewable energy technologies. So the transition to decarbonized grid. Um, I'll touch on that in the, in the next slide. And just finally on the transmission and distribution, estimated around 220 million tonnes of aluminium in the global T&D network at the minute. And they think that over the next 20 years, a, a good quantity of that is going to need to be replaced. So one, there's going to be a big source of scrap of 6,000 series, which is a widely used alloy across a number of different sectors that will be available for use. But also it needs to be replaced with more aluminium. So that's just something to consider as well. So on renewable energy technologies, obviously we need to transition away from fossil fuels. We need to move to more, more renewable energies um, to help tackle climate change. Just one thing to take into account though, is the amount of aluminium required for those renewable energy technologies. So this figure here shows essentially the amount of aluminium Per megawatt, uh, per megawatt output for those uh, energy sources. So on the left-hand side, you can see solar, wind, onshore and offshore. Per megawatt hour requires quite a bit more aluminium. And then we have fossil fuel, tip, uh, traditional fossil fuels, coal and gas uh, facilities, and then hydro and nuclear, which output enormous amounts of, of energy um, and therefore have a relatively lower amount of aluminium per, per megawatt. Obviously, I'm not therefore saying we shouldn't be developing more renewable energy technologies. It's just something that we, we need to take into account. And the source of that aluminium, as I'll go into in, in the next few slides, is going to be critical to uh, the environmental impact of those renewable energy technologies. The final sector I'm going to talk about is sometimes an overlooked sector. And I'm glad somebody's brought a lot of aluminium beverage cans because I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about them. I get very passionate about beverage cans now. Um, but packaging. So it's not just beverage cans, it's a whole host of applications where aluminium is used across the packaging sector. And generally you can categorize them depending on their thickness. So you can see in this table here, we have on the on the thinner end the converter foils between six and 50 microns. Then we have up to your impact extrusion slugs, which would be used more for aerosols, bottles, and tubes. They'll be 
two to five millimeters thick in, in the wall thickness. But I'm going to talk about beverage cans because beverage cans are by far one of the most widely used um, applications for aluminium in packaging. And beverage cans are actually seen as a model example of a circular economy, um, which is which is great. However, I think we can do a lot better. So just around that, I'm going to put some facts and figures around that circularity case for aluminium. This study was done by a consultancy on behalf of the International Aluminium Institute. And they essentially mapped out the global flow of aluminium for the beverage can market. So they started, if we start on the left-hand side, they started with how much material is put on the market. And then they tracked essentially what happens to that material. So with 100% of the material on the, on the market, about a third of that is lost, whether it's through landfills, incinerators, or a small amount of process loss as well. So we end up with, we see the infinite times minus losses recycling. We end up with about two, two out of three cans are recycled. But one of those cans is recycled into a different aluminium application. So it's downcycled. It doesn't go back into a can. So only one can out of three globally actually ends up back as a can. So if this is the model example of a circular system and only 33% ends up back into its original application, that, mm, it, I mean, it's still better. It's better than the other aluminium sectors. It's better than most other materials systems, but it's definitely something that needs to be improved in the future. And there are ambitious targets that have been set out in the EU and in the US around increasing collection rates, complete increasing recycling rates, and hopefully increasing that closed loop recycling rate as well, which is all well and good. But there is one, one major issue to really achieving a fully circular aluminium beverage can. And that's the fact that a beverage can is made out of two different alloys. You've got a can body, which is about 80% of the mass in a typical 330 mil can. Is made from a 3000 series, so 3104. Uh, the can end and the tab is made from typically a 5182 alloy, so that is a magnesium based alloy. So these two different alloys have a completely different chemical composition. Even the impurity elements, iron, silicon, copper, can completely different levels of control in those alloys. Now, the reason that the can end and tab is made of 5182. It's not only due to the sort of in-service properties, but it's the through process properties as well, the formability and the required strengths um, at the right stage through processing means that you just cannot use 3104 unless you significantly change the design, which nobody wants to do because that will cost hundreds of millions in new can manufacturing lines. So this can has been the same for decades. It's a very innovative product but it's not changed. And in order to achieve a truly circular system, this problem needs to be solved. There are projects ongoing now that some Innoval are involved in, some not. Advanced sorting technologies are getting better at separating three and 5,000 series. Um, uni alloy can is, is one of the main solutions where the whole can is made out of one alloy. But as I've already mentioned, that comes with a lot of, uh, a lot of investment required. And there are other projects as well that, that have some potential. Before I move on to the sort of second half of this talk, I always like to ask the audience, how many cans do you think are produced annually on a global scale? Just shout out some numbers. What do you think? 10 million, 1 million, billion? More? 500 million, any takes on 500 million? 5 billion? One more, any takes on 5 billion? 10 billion, 400 billion, give, give a take. Um, I, I, I did have to check this. You can work it out with the amount of material that's put on the market and most cans, well, all cans of, of the same size are very, very similar. So yeah, 400 billion cans. I mean, the UK produces 15 billion alone. So it's a large amount. 
If there's one thing you take away from this talk today, I say this every single time, is that if you recycle one beverage can, 330 mil can, you're, you're saving enough energy to run a TV for three hours. That's one can. And that's because of the amount of energy secondary processing takes compared to primary processing. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So please recycle your beverage cans. <laughs> so with that in mind, so the second half of this talk is going to talk around all those sustainability aspects that I've, I've talked about. And the fact that there is a big increase in demand that's, that's coming for the aluminium sector. Because the big issue with that are the emissions that the sector puts out. So in 2018, as you see in the top right hand corner, the total emissions from the sector, 1.1 billion tonnes. So in 2018, that was about 2% of world emissions. And I know I haven't updated this, but I know that it's now around 3% of world emissions, if not a little bit higher than that. You look at steel and cement as well. Steel and cement between them contribute around 14% of world emissions. So you've got three material systems that contribute over 15% of all world emissions. So clearly we need to we need to tackle this. Each industry needs to tackle this. In order to do that, first we need to understand where the emissions are actually coming from. So this table just breaks down that 1.1 billion tons in a little bit more detail. So if you have a look in the bottom right hand corner, you can see that total figure. Now what I've highlighted in the black box is the primary aluminium sector. So everything in that black box is all the emissions from just primary production. And you can see the figures on the bottom row, if you add those up, 95%, if not more, of all aluminium sector emissions comes from just primary production. And that's two thirds of total industry output. The other third from secondary industry, recycling, about a percent or two, that's for the other third of global output. You then have some contribution from semi-fabrication, so rolling, extrusion, die casting. And then there's a, a small amount of contribution from the generation of, of pre-consumer scrap as well. But the message is, I mean, it's clear that the primary aluminium industry is, is the heart of the emissions of the sector. And even within that, you can see the majority comes from the electrolysis stage. So this is the reduction of the alumina down to pure aluminium and oxygen. It takes an insane amount of electricity to do that. See this electricity row at the top? Huge, huge contribution is from the generation of electricity. So as you can imagine, again, the source of that electricity heavily dictates the final carbon footprint of the primary aluminium. And I'll show that effect in, in a couple of slides. So the International Aluminium Institute didn't just leave it there. Obviously, they didn't just say, oh, here you go. There's a huge amount of emissions. Deal with it. They, with a, along with a few other agencies and, and institutes, modeled the pathway that the industry needs to achieve to align itself with a 1.5 degree scenario. And that's the orange line here. So we're starting in 2018, about 1.1 billion tonnes. We need to get down to 53 million tonnes. That's the, essentially the budget allowed to align with a 1.5 degree scenario. So it's 95% reduction, over 95% reduction, while maintaining growth of about 80% to 2050. So you've got growth in, in emissions are like, are like this, um, which is which is daunting task, <laughs> definitely. And I know so far this might appear quite doom and gloom this talk i've got a really bad slide next <laughs> because they updated this for 2022 and not only are we not on 1.5 degree scenario we're actually above business as usual so we're still going in the wrong direction in terms of reducing overall sector emissions i'm going to get more positive now <laughs> i'm going to talk about how we're going to do it because with those modeling, modeling the pathways, collecting the data on overall emissions. They've also highlighted how we're going to do it. We know the barriers that need to be overcome, whether they're technological, social, or economical. Essentially, there's three pathways 
to reducing emissions down to that 53 million tonnes. Of course, energy decarbonisation is number one. We've seen that the electricity and where that comes from is one of the, the main contributors to overall sector emissions. Direct pro process emissions. I've already alluded to the fact that alumina, when it's smelted, produces pure aluminium, but also oxygen, which combines with a carbon anode, producing CO2 as a direct process emission. And then we have increased use of secondary material. So end of life scrap and maximizing the use of pre-consumer scraps and manufacturing scrap as well. So I'm gonna to touch on each one of those pathways just in one, one or two slides. So energy decarbonization, it, it's an obvious one, but it, this really shows the effect that it has when you use it for primary aluminum production. So the left-hand axis is the emissions intensity for primary aluminum production per tonne of aluminum. And this is the tonne of CO2 equivalent, so a tonne of greenhouse gases emitted. The world average is about 16 tonnes per tonne at the minute. And you can see the, the biggest contribution in blue is from electricity. Now, if we were to use just coal-fired uh, coal facility for the generation of the electricity, you're going to be up at about 20 tonnes per tonne. If you use gas-fired, traditionally the Middle East, then you're going to be at around nine tonnes per tonne. If you use a mixed grid, so that might be aluminium, say, from Europe, because Europe has quite a high fraction of renewables and natural gas and a little bit of coal, then the footprint of primary aluminium is about seven tonnes per tonne at the minute. If you can use 100% renewable energy, and a lot of sites do this, a lot of sites have dedicated hydropower plants, solar, especially in the Middle East, Norwegians, they have a lot of dedicated hydropower and, and the Canadians as well then that contribution from electricity becomes really small, as you can see on the right hand side. But to achieve a 1.5 degree scenario, primary aluminium needs to be at 0.5 tonnes per tonne. So that's still not enough to bring those overall emissions down. So all these pathways need to work in combination. So that leads me to direct emissions reduction. So I mentioned that CO2 is a direct byproduct from smelting. There is a, a conglomerate that is looking at inert anodes, and this technology is called Alesis. This is the first bullet point. Using inert anodes, you wipe out all CO2 as a direct byproduct. You actually generate oxygen as a direct byproduct. Fantastic. Sounds really, really good. However, this has been developed over the past decade or more, and we're not exactly sure how far away we are from introducing this on a global scale. So we think that by 2030, that might be the point where this can be really expanded out to most smelters around the world, potentially. But as you can imagine, businesses being businesses, they're very secretive about where they are in developing this technology. And it's very difficult to get any information out, out of them. Um, but you do see some, some news articles of companies signing up to use the, the aluminium that is output using this technology. There are other technologies as well that are discussed. I'm not going to touch on CCUS because it will play more of a minor role in aluminium. It's not seen as a, as a major key lever in the really big reductions for, for carbon emissions. Australia, this is another technology that's currently being developed. This technology is about using what you might call dirty scrap or scrap that's very mixed and has a very random composition and about extracting very pure high grade aluminium. Again, sounds absolutely fantastic. The caveat is it also uses an incredible amount of electricity. So if that electricity is not from a renew renewable source, then uh, it might not actually be that beneficial. So final pathway, recycling. We've already alluded to the fact that it requires um, a very small amount of energy in comparison to primary production. It's about 5% of the energy. And with that comes a huge reduction in emissions. You, you're not smelting, you're not refining, or you're not extracting, you're not mining either. You are remelting and casting of that scrap and potentially some advanced sorting technologies in there as well. We put all that together and the emissions are over 95% uh, fewer emissions compared to primary production. And even the cost 
it works out economically because scrap is is much cheaper i mean the the dirtier scraps so the scraps that are more mixed and further away from your composition are cheaper and yes you've got to do a lot more work to bring it towards your composition but even with that it still works out economically and that is why you do see um there are there is a lot of investment in the secondary aluminium market and why we see that increase in demand from secondary aluminium growing um a couple of final slides so one big question well if everybody wants to use scrap where's it going to come from are we going to have enough um the forecast in scrap production or scrap from end of life is is due to increase one because we're using more aluminium and, and two a lot of those applications are coming to the end of life over the next few decades and that's across all major sectors where aluminium is used I just wanted to highlight that one of the projects, there's many, many sort of global and regional projects that are happening around improving the quality of secondary aluminium ingots. And this is a project that Innoval are involved in, this project's called Surfnal. It's a government backed project, so I can talk about it, thankfully. Um, and it's called, so it stands for Circular and Constant Aluminium. And this project is all around taking off the market scrap using advanced sorting technologies, remelting and casting a billet that will achieve the exactly the same properties of high performance alloys for automotive applications, but using a high quantity of post-consumer scrap. So this project's been running about 18 months now. You can see some of the major players involved. So Cuprol and Scan Metals, their businesses are buying scrap and sorting scrap and then selling it, selling it on. Milva Metals, remelt and cast. Um, scrap to, to billets. Constellium are a major aluminium producer of roll sheet and extrusions. And then we have uh, ourselves as, a, as the consultancy in testing and characterization. And then we have the OEMs on board. So BMW and Gordon Murray Design, who are leading on some of the testing of the, the products at the, at the end. And it's been really about 18 months. And already we're seeing really good results in terms of we are producing aluminium billets that are achieving the specifications required for BMW and Gordon Murray. We're using 80, 90 percent post-consumer scrap. And that's not just scrap taken off the market and then sorted to the nth degree to get exactly the composition you're looking for. The economics work out as well. It's been sorted once, maybe twice through certain advanced sorting lines. And we are getting those compositions that, that we're looking for. So, so far, so good. And there's a number of other projects uh, like that. I did want to finish on a positive note, because I know this is quite a, not negative, but it's a realistic outlook, uh, let's say. But what this figure shows, and I'm happy to share the, the, the slides if you want to have a look at these in detail, this highlights all the projects, major projects around the world, around those three different pathways. So energy decarbonization, recycling and process emission reductions. These are major aluminium companies or regional projects that are working on those three pathways um, right now and, and bringing them to industry sooner rather than later. So as a final slide, even though we might be over business as usual at the minute, there is indications that we are going to start to see that transition to to uh, to coming down. Whether we can achieve the the gradients that the one point five degree scenario pathway shows, it is achievable. We know what technologies need to be brought to market. We have a good idea of the investments that are required. There are discussions of where that investment is going to come from, but that's not my area. <laughs> um, but I think I, I think it's achievable if those technologies are, are brought to, to market. So what I'd like to think is just as a few, a few key final points on the left-hand side, where we are today or 2018 to 2023, I'd like to think that people are trying to pursue respon responsibly sourced primary aluminium. So that's primary aluminium using as much renewable energy to produce it as possible. Increasing the use of secondary aluminium. Moving on to 2030, we really need to be up in the volumes of secondary material streams, so from post-consumer and pre-consumer scrap. 
And by 2050, we know that we need to be around 0.5 tonnes per tonne for primary aluminium, and we need to be using as much end-of-life scrap and free consumer scrap as possible. So that's my that's my final slide. So I think I've given a 10 minutes for or so for questions. So thank you very much. Thank you.